All right, so for my hero project, I'm going to be highlighting some heroes um, who lived around the World War II era. And um, the neat thing about this is that they're everyday heroes. They're not the big heroes like Winston Churchill that you hear about all the time. They're heroes that you may not have heard about who made sometimes huge sacrifices and changed a lot. So um, today I'm going to go back to 1937, so a little bit before World War II started, um, and we're going to talk about China. So in August of 1937, the Japanese Imperial Army started invading China. Um, or sorry, they started invading Nanking. And so then it was called Nanking. Now we call it Nanjing. Invading Nanking. And there were a lot of Western merchants, missionaries, physicians, people there for economic, educational reasons from the West. And when the Japanese Imperial Army started invading um, Nanking, the Western governments were like, oh, you guys got to get out of there. It's getting kind of dangerous. So these Westerners, and most of them left, um, because it was, it was really dangerous. And but there were a few of them who stayed. And I'm gonna be talking about one of the people who stayed. Now it's 1937, in August of 1937, the Japanese Imperial Army started invading Nanking. And so now I'm gonna talk about um, this guy. His name was John Rabe. And the cool thing about him was that he was German. He was a Nazi. Um, he was kind of high up in the Nazi ranks, but he really believed it. He really believed in Germany. He was a strong supporter of the Nazis and Germany, and he did a lot of good, which is something that you don't hear about. You There are so many atrocities that were committed by the Germans that you don't hear about this. Um, so, we're going to be talking about the rape of Nanking and what happened. It was a six-week period, um, and the Japanese Imperial Army invaded Nanking, and they began looting, destroying, and raping, and doing some awful, awful things. The International Committee for the Nanking Safety Zone was formed on November 22nd, 1937. It was a zone for civilians and for people who didn't have weapons. There were no weapons allowed for non-combatants. And the hope was that it would be a safe zone, that if the Japanese Imperial Army came in, they wouldn't attack the people there because they were just civilians. Um, the Japanese Imperial Army did come in. That was December 13th, 1937. The Japanese Imperial Army um, took over Nanking and it was so I'm going to read you just an excerpt of a testimony from one of the women who survived the rape of Nanking so this was um, a lady named Wen Tsunchi um, and she said my name is Wen Tsunchi this year I turned 82 years old my house was originally in the Z Zangwan district of Nanjing when the Japanese entered the city on the December of 1937, many retreating Chinese nationalist troops attempted to cross the river to escape, with some even coming to my house to board. When the sky was getting dark, my entire family took refuge at the nearby Hutchinson International. En route, we saw Japanese warships rake down crossing Chinese troops with indiscriminate machine gun fire. The refugees of Hutchinson International were many. <laughs> One day, six or seven Japanese troops arrived, all of them armed with guns, knives hanging by their waists. They took six or seven maidens from the crowd of refugees. I was among those taken. There was also a maiden I recognized. Her name was Little Kwaizoi. One Japanese soldier forced me into an empty room. I, rem I can remember him being chubby with a beard. Once we were both in the room, he used a knife to force me to take off my pants. I would be killed if I didn't. I was thus raped in this manner. After the rape, the Japanese soldier turned to me and said, open path, open path, and I was released. 
in order to avoid the Japanese soldiers coming again to hurt us that night. The manager of the Hutchinson International ferried us about 18 maidens to the cellar of the egg beating room. Those among us also included several maidens who had escaped from the Suzhou prefecture of Jiangsu. I hid in that cellar for several months, with the owner secretly sending me food. Only after the situation was deemed peaceful did I return to live with my mother and father. I had lived in the Hutchinson International for more than a year before I returned home. Okay, so this is just one story um, among thousands. There were so many people who were affected by this and um, the estimated um, number of people killed by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East was um, 200,000 killed um, and that was in 1946 that they decided that. However, China's official estimate is 300,000. Um, that's 300,000 Chinese who were killed over a six-week period. It was pretty brutal. Um, and the man that we're talking about today, a man named John Rabe, um, he was part of the people who set up the safety zone. So he was part of these people in the safety zone and he helped the Chinese. In his diary, he wrote about digging voxels in his backyard to um, protect Chinese, um, keeping them there. So there were like 650 Chinese who he kept um, just in his backyard, not even in this, or not even part technically of the safety zone. Um, he repelled Japanese troops who tried to climb over the wall. He would bring rice to people outside the safety zone who needed it. Um, and he wrote in his journal, These escapades were quite dangerous. The Japanese had pistols and bayonets, and I, as mentioned before, had only party symbols and my swastika armband. He stayed behind and worked hard to protect these people and um there's in modern times there's a movie about him which i think is so cool but back then he went back to germany after this and the germans didn't want him um china even offered later on to pay him money and help him live a more comfortable life in china if he would testify against Japan in one of these war crime trials and he wouldn't do it so he died poor um, back in Germany and I think that's the end of the story.